I've noticed over the weeks since our public Bible reading has been the book of Revelation, it's got into some very interesting parts of it that I probably ought to teach a lesson on the book of Revelation to make sure we understand what all is being said. Be that as it may, we'll consider that. But today, I want to speak after or about a man after God's own heart. Now, this lesson this morning will stand on its own as to the message it has to give to us. But also, it will tie in with the lesson this afternoon. Even though the lesson this afternoon will be able to stand on its own without the lesson of this morning. But together, I think they will be helpful. How does the world view a person when they call that person great? That is, how do they judge greatness in a person? We mentioned in class this morning, and we're all familiar with somebody like Alexander the Great, or in Russia, Peter the Great, so on. There's reasons that those people were given the great and when you study what they did for their time and the position they were in, you will see how that not only for their generation did they do things that were far bigger, if you please, than others, but for many generations to follow so that they are still called in history the great. But usually this has to do with fame that they get for one reason or the other. Or maybe with some like movie stars, their looks. Maybe it's their great possessions. Or their education. And you could add other things to that and maybe all of these combined. And the world says that's a great person. But the question we raise this morning is, what is, from God's viewpoint, true greatness? Which would tell us how to look at people before we call them properly and rightly great. I would simply say that a person is great when they take the ability that God gave them, coupled with their desire, their strong desire, to serve and please God in whatever station of life they find themselves, that's a great person. And when you look at the people that God called great, you'll see that He talks about people great in the faith. And that leads you then into a study of what the Bible has to teach about faith, what it actually is. And you see, even God categorizes faith. You'll read of weak faith, strong faith, dead faith, and so on. But the world bows at the feet of a God named Big from the world's standpoint of what's big and important. And we cannot, as servants of God, as members of His church, view who is great and who is not on the basis of the world's standards. All too often, that gets into the church as to who is great and who is not. <clears throat> it's caused many problems over the years among brethren in churches. And it basically comes down to the pride of life, that is the vain glory of life, and people viewing who's a big shot, so to speak, another way of saying great, and who's not, as to their relationship to God, how God views them. One of the principles that Paul emphasizes is that God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the wise. 
He's always chosen things that men did, did not consider much. And when you see his son, God in the flesh, who came to this world, he had none of that kind of greatness. He would be considered by Romans and others to be just a very weak need person as far as how they deemed who's important, who should be a king. And that's one reason that he was a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks' foolishness. He did not fit their idea, maybe we could say stereotype, of who is great and how one is great. Well, that's introductory because I said a man after God's own heart. If you're familiar with the Bible, you know we're going to talk about David. And when we mention David, who became King David, we're basically saying David, who is God's man. David, God's man. In Acts 13, 22, it's recorded this way. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after God's own heart. At least it's brought out there. David's greatness and favor with God cannot be attributed to what? Would you say because he became king? Or because he was statesman? Author or the sweet singer of Israel, a writer of Psalms, or because he was very successful in battle against God's enemies, and he was all of those things. Is that why he was great? Samuel said to King Saul, the king who preceded David, because of Saul's sin, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14. Now if you want to get a full picture of that, read the first 13 verses of 1 Samuel 16. And you'll see the whole story taught. But knowing the Old Testament, Romans 15, 4, was written four times for our learning, we Christians who are under the authority of Christ in the New Testament, to enlighten us and help us better in our service to God in submitting to the authority of Christ and in this idea of who's great from God's perspective, then I have to look at this and say there's a lesson here that will help me be a better Christian a better whatever in the Lord's church. There's an attitude, a state of mind, We're talking about the heart again. And God said David was a man after God's own heart. There's a disposition of mind that David had as it had respect to God, to deity. I think you can see that in the book of Proverbs Chapter 4 and verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We sometimes say that in fighting the fight of faith, that is, being faithful to God, that the battle begins in the mind that if we can keep the mind thinking properly and reasoning properly, then we've got much of the battle won. Because whatever we do in our actions, the choices we make and anything we do begins in the depths of our being, we would say the heart of the mind. Now, there's a lot of things along that line that within themselves, those choices are not necessarily wrong. But they lead us towards something that may not be the best for us. A good example of that is Abraham's nephew, Lot. Remember when 
they were so rich in flocks and herds that there wasn't enough pasture land for both lots, flocks and herds, and Abraham. And their herdmen were getting in trouble with one another, I guess, infringing upon one another's grazing grounds or something like that. Well, Abraham had that wonderful statement, let there be no strife between us, for we be brethren. Great lesson in that as you apply that to the church and the spiritual brethren we have as to how we should strive to be one with another. But Abraham said, you take the choice of the land where you want to go. We've got to separate. And I'll take what's left. There was not a thing contrary to God's will. In other words, there was no sin involved in Lot choosing the well-watered Jordan plain. Nothing wrong with that. But the next account we have of Lot is that he has pitched his tent toward Sodom and he's in Sodom. Now let me drive a peg down here and let it settle in well, parents, children, just individually. You can make choices that within themselves are not sinful. But also they are not advantageous for helping you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. They put you many times into a situation that gives the devil the advantage rather than you. And you see what happened in Lot when that happened. Now God continues to call him, Peter does by inspiration, a righteous man. Now the ungodliness and immorality of the city in which he was grated on his nerves the way we'd say it today. But look what it cost him. One of the things that doesn't get taught like it ought to be taught in the church is somebody says, well, is it a sin to do that? Well, not necessarily. But as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we make decisions, and they may not be decisions that help us expedite obeying God. They may be pitching our tents towards Sodom, and it gets easier to do that. I don't think many members ever do that because they hardly can get past the fundamentals of the plan of salvation in the church's work organization and worship. This happens many times in parents rearing children. I didn't know all along that this was uh, something that I would take note of, but after all the years of working with people, being around folks, listening to them, observing, I've seen a number of brethren over the years in the various congregations I've been a part of, and knowing of them in other places. They did very well in service to God, at least outwardly they seem to be. They're involved in the work of the church. And while their children are under their jurisdiction and they can get them to do what they want them to do, no problem there. But you know what children have a habit of doing? Since they're individuals with their own wills and likes and dislikes, they grow up. And especially they go through adolescence. Now they're neither babies or little children. And they're neither fully mature either when they go through that. They're in the process of maturing. And they begin to many times make choices or they let their views known. And it doesn't go along with what has been very easy when they can be controlled and they start going this way or that way. And next thing you know, some of them actually choose to sin. Now what's mom and daddy to do? <clears throat> well, we've seen mom and daddy all along do right when it came to other people sinning. And of course, everybody knows one set of parents can know better how to raise somebody else's kids than they do their own. But what happens? 
they seek to justify their children, especially after they're grown and away from home in the sins they commit. You see that in marriage, divorce, remarriage, and all sorts of jobs they take, where they go, what they get involved in. I don't know where we ever came under the idea that because there's a strong familial emotional attachment to our own flesh and blood, that God says, that's all right. You can let them go ahead and violate my will. You just, just know I'll take care of it. Well, that's deceiving ourselves because everybody is somebody's child. And you would do well to remember that you too are somebody's child no matter how chronologically old you are. So when you look at David, when you look at Lot and other Old Testament characters and other people, then you might realize when it says David was a man after God's own heart, that says a whole lot about him that couldn't be said about others. It Did it mean that he wasn't going to make mistakes and sin? Certainly not. But the thing that stood out great about David as much as anything, because he was a man after God's own heart, when David saw his sin, he always was teachable, and he always would repent of his sins. That can't be said of a lot of people. So what were David's attributes of character? And that's what we're talking about. Well, a heart that was free of revenge. You know, he knew that God had put Saul into the position of king. He had uh, two times at least that he could have taken Saul's life, but he didn't. His idea was God will remove him. He put him in there and he will remove him. And when he heard of Saul's death, David had this to say in 2 Samuel 1, 19. The glory of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? And you see that same disposition of heart in Jesus. He's on the cross. He is sinless. He was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. And on the cross, he would say to his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we can see, too, that he never sought revenge in his life and what he came to do as, a Christ, as, a, as the Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Verses 20 and 24. Remember, Peter wrote that to Christians because they needed to understand they're to live like Christ. Verse 20 begins, For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable to God. For even here in two were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. What about this one that we should follow? Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. When we do an injury to someone, 
you really, if you're your enemy, put yourself below your enemy according to the teachings of God. We can conclude that revenging oneself makes you but even with him, if such is possible. But having a disposition to want to forgive a person, and in one's mind ready to forgive that person's sins, even though you're being charged with being the sinner, that sets you above him. And we see that in the very life of Christ. And we see it in a man after God's own heart. David himself. A heart must be humble. David really wanted to hide Saul's death because of the wicked pagans all around about them, such as the Philistines and others. Notice he refers to the Philistines, tell it not in Gath, talking about Saul's death. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. 1 Samuel 1, 19. That seems to tell me that in spiritual Israel, the church, God's family today, while there will be problems arising within the church, we're not that interested in publishing it all over the place. It doesn't mean we don't recognize the problems for what they are if it involves sin. But the Bible tells us how in the church to handle those things and to deal with them. It's not that we're trying to hide them as if nobody in the church ever makes mistakes. The Bible is full of material that shows God's people making mistakes. Some repented, some didn't. But it tells us that we want the church to handle its own affairs and we want it to appear as God wants it to appear as his family, a righteous institution before a world that is not. David was a person that had a heart, since his heart was one that God recognized as what it, we ought to have, that was not disturbed over the apparent prosperity of evil men. This so-called prosperity gospel that's been preached for years and years by radio and then especially television among the denominations, and I'm afraid even some brethren have looked at it that if I'm really faithful to God, then God's going to bless me with all sorts of physical things. Well, that's not a sign of being godly necessarily. You know, David was anointed to be king and Saul called David to play his harp for him. That would settle Saul down in his mental anguish. And here David began disappointing experience. And it was to plague him the rest of his life. Saul became so jealous of David that he wanted to kill him. And for a number of years, Saul literally hunted David until God took him out of the way by the Philistines. But then you had a problem. His son Absalom forced him to flee for his life. We're not going into all the details of this. Nevertheless, that's what happened. But I think the thing to do when you look, even going into detail, if you want to go back and read that, and you should, is how all this stuff developed in his life. You can't find where David acted rashly in these things. If you will, turn over to the book of Psalms. I want to read something in Psalm 37. Verse 1, and then we'll look at verse 7, and then verse 8. This is a psalm of David. Notice what he says to us. 
Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Now drop down to verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. I sometimes wonder about the song. Farther along we know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. Cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll all understand it by and by. I don't mean to completely set that song aside but if I know my Bible, I know all about it right now. <laughs> I know what David said here. While there are others living about us, living in sin, the psalm says. Well, it's reflecting what David said. Are you faithful to God? Do you do what God says? Then tell me, if God's for us, who can be against us? Why should we envy the people around us? when they have far more than we do. And here we are laboring to know and do the truth and be honest with God and ourselves and our brethren, and yet we don't see these things happening. That's not the way to measure your righteousness, your faithfulness, your godliness. Seeing the unrighteous prosper, especially in the age in which we live, is sometimes hard for the faithful, the righteous people, to bear. And yet in his day, could you be any greater than David as far as having those things? No. And a lot of folks reach a stage because of material gain or wanting it. Well, what's the use? What's the use? Well, the life of David shows, first of all, he is a man after God's own heart. But it shows us that God is able to make all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Those who trust in God, those who are faithful, those who take him at his word, those who spend their lives learning the truth, bringing their life in subjection to the will of Christ. That's Christianity. Delight in the Lord. And rest in the Lord. Psalm 37. If we're not going to be happy, except happy like the world is happy, you'll never be happy. David had a heart willing to admit sin and unworthiness. Because none of what I've said about David thus far, even having a heart after God's, after God, means that he didn't make a mistake. No, nobody that's mentioned in the Bible ever lived a sinless life but Jesus. There's always the human aspect. As these people are called great, they still made mistakes. But his heart was willing to admit sin, to admit his unworthiness. You had the sin with Bathsheba, murder coming out of all of that, her husband, Uriah the Hittite. That was when David, as king, was at the zenith of his power. But wasn't it wonderful that he had a prophet that was so great in his service to God that he would say to the king what needed to be said, though he virtually was putting his own life on the line. And he let David convince himself that he was wrong. That's good when you can do that. David becomes so enraged that the little ewe lamb belonging to the poor man was taken by the rich man who could afford all sorts of things and used to feed and a feast to a bunch of people. That enraged him. David was a shepherd. David understood. David had an attachment to those things. And he said, take him and kill him, basically. Basically. 
And Nathan said, thou art the man. You have all of this before you. You could have gotten a wife from anywhere else. God's given you everything. All you had to do. But this is where I want to be like David. On anything wherein I might transgress God's will. I want to be able to immediately upon seeing my sins have the contrite heart. You see that heart that God recognizes and calls great also is a contrite heart. David repented. And listen to what the prophet said. Nathan said, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Brethren, that's where we're headed with the preaching of the gospel and urging people to believe it, to honestly receive it. It's so that they will receive it in obedience to it that they won't have to die. Because that second death is an unending death. Total and complete separation from God in a place prepared for the devil and his angels. All because they would not serve him. So in this little brief lesson, we've seen a heart that's free of revenge. We've seen an humble heart. A heart not disturbed over the apparent prosperity of evil men. And that's an amazing thing. We should not allow those things to trouble us. Now, one thing I think stands out about this particular sermon, not because of who delivered it, or because it's so in-depth in its scholarship and so forth, but the power of it seen in its simplicity. Anybody wanting to understand the message can. And messages like this are what causes people, if they want to, to see things in their lives they might not see if we spend a lot of time going through the Greek or whatever else. And I'm not saying there's not a place for that. There is. But I'm saying this is the kind of thing to my brethren. Remember, I'm basically talking about my brethren, yet it does have to do with people who are not Christians as to their disposition of heart and how they receive the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8, 11. So whatever we do in life in becoming a Christian or living the Christian life, you'll always need to cultivate a good and honest heart, Luke 8, 15. To be a man or a woman after God's own heart is to have a disposition of mind toward God and the things of this world that David had. What a wonderful thing it is to me and having this kind of lesson that benefits me. And yet intellectually, how powerful it is, but coming from such a simple way that God has presented it. You can't miss it. You might resist it. You might turn it down. You might deny it. You might decide to keep on going your own way that's contrary to God's will. But you can't miss the truth of this lesson and the importance of it in living life and serving God. If you're not a Christian today, we don't close the lesson without giving a person the opportunity to obey the gospel of Christ. Having heard this about the disposition of mind, what is your disposition of mind toward God? Your attitude of heart. You need to obey the gospel by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, what is your disposition of mind now? Do you regard sin in your life and you're not doing anything about it? We hope not. We hope that all of us, and we pray that, will be like David when sin came in his life. When he was convinced of it, convicted of it, he immediately repented. If you're subject, therefore, the great invitation of our loving Lord, we invite you to come to him while we stand and sing.